Hello and welcome to the third video in the female reproductive pathology section. Uh, in this video, I'm going to focus on menstrual disorders and premenstrual syndrome and amenorrhea. Uh, before we talk about any menstrual disorders, it's important to look at some of the definitions of what a normal menstruation is. And there are actually guidelines out there on this. These are the FIGO MDC 2015 guidelines. Uh, and you can read more about this and up to date under the section abnormal uterine bleeding in reproductive age women. Um, so typically we look at frequency, regularity, duration, and volume. Uh, a normal frequency of menses would be every 24 to 38 days. Uh, frequent uterine bleeding or polymenorrhea are periods less than every 24 days. And infrequent uterine bleeding, uh, also known as oligomenorrhea, are periods uh, greater than every 38 days. Uh, menarche, we saw that, so the, oh, we've already talked about this, the age of onset of menses, menopause is cessation of menses, uh, and it's considered natural if it's over the age of 40. Amenorrhea is the absence of menses, and it can be primary, and that's failure to reach menarche by the age 15, uh, or lack of pubertal development by age 13, and secondary amenorrhea cessation of previously regular menses for three months or in a regular menses for six months. So those are kind of important definitions to know. Uh, the regularity is usually with a variation of less than or equal to seven to nine days. So there should be no more than seven to nine day difference between the shortest to the longest cycles. Um, cycle length is the number of days from the first day of one menstrual cycle to the first day of the next uh, menstrual cycle. In young girls, long cycle lengths usually evolve uh, over time to fit the norm. So they often can be very long at first and they start to shorten. Uh, metrorrhagia is uterine bleeding at irregular intervals, usually between the expected periods. All right, duration of a menstrual period should be less than or equal to eight days. Usually it's a lot less than that, but it can be up to eight days. Um, and that's the number of days of bleeding in a single menstrual period. So prolonged menstrual bleeding would be bleeding for more than eight days, and that's usually associated with heavy menstrual bleeding, or HMB. And then finally, we have the volume of menses, and that uh, is subjective because we usually are not measuring that with special measuring tools, uh, but it's defined as the volume that does not interfere with a woman's physical, social, emotional, and or material quality of life. Um, so the research definition is that it should be less than 80 milliliters of vaginal blood loss per cycle. Again, blood contains endometrial tissue and blood, so it's not just blood. Um, and, uh, but, but we're not usually measuring that. So usually we just uh, say a normal volume is defined as one that doesn't interfere with a woman's physical, social, emotional, and or material quality of life. Hypomenorrhea is abnormally light menses. Menorrhagia is abnormally heavy or prolonged menses. Uh, again, this is known as heavy menstrual bleeding. And then menometrorrhagia is combination of metrorrhagia and menorrhagia. So prolonged or excessive uterine bleeding that occurs irregularly and more frequently than normal. So those are, uh, just keep those different terms straight. That's gonna help you as we go through some of this. Um, now, other different uh, definitions here, ovulation disorders. So, oligo ovulation would be infrequent or irregular ovulation, and that's usually associated with oligomenorrhea. Uh, and then anovulation would be absence of normally expected ovulation in a premenopausal woman. Uh, that often is associated with amenorrhea. Uh, dysmenorrhea is pain during menstruation, and that usually begins around the time that menstruation begins, and symptoms typically last less than three days. Uh, pain is usually centered in the pelvis or the lower abdomen. And then finally, chronic abnormal uterine bleeding, or AUB, it's also called dysfunctional uterine bleeding. That's bleeding from the uterine body or the corpus uh, that is abnormal in frequency, regularity, duration, or volume. And it's present for at least the majority of the last six months. Um, now, I'm not going to go into the full discussion of dysfunctional uterine bleeding here. This is part of gynecology. Um, but we use the PALM COIN acronym to classify the different causes of AUB. So PALM would refer to structural causes, and that could be uterine polyps, uh, adenomyosis, where we get endometrial tissue growing into the uh, smooth muscle, the myometrium, a leomyoma, which is a smooth muscle, a benign smooth muscle tumor uh, in the uterus, also known as a fibroid, 
uh, any uterine cancer or hyperplasia. And then COIN would refer to non-structural causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. That could be having a coagulopathy, ovarian dysfunction, endometrial dysfunction. It could be iatrogenic, so that's medical procedure induced or not otherwise specified. So we're typically going through those differentials when a woman presents with abnormal uterine bleeding um, to try to isolate the cause. Okay, so uh, that's just kind of more memorization of terms, but it, I think it's important to sort of lay those out so that we're familiar with them. So a very common menst menstrual disorder is uh, premenstrual syndrome, PMS, and that's characterized by the presence of physical and or behavioral symptoms. Uh, they occur repetitively in the luteal phase, so the second half of the menstrual cycle, often occur in the first few days of menses, so they can extend into the actual bleeding time, and then uh, symptoms average about six days a month. Um, they typically interfere with activities of daily living. So clinically significant PMS occurs in up to three to 8% of women statistically, some argue it's higher. Uh, symptoms usually resolve, are resolved in pregnancy and in menopause, and symptoms may still be present even after hysterectomy. Um, there is a more severe form of premenstrual syndrome which involves more effective or behavioral problems, and that is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD. Uh, and this has DSM-5 criteria for its definition. We know that PMS is worsened by stress, caffeine, alcohol, and a high salt diet, amongst other things. Um, there's been over 200 symptoms reported with PMS, um, but typically we divide them into physical or affective and behavioral symptoms. So abdominal bloating, severe fatigue, breast tenderness, headaches, hot flashes, dizziness, cyclic acne, and constipation diarrhea would all be uh, some of the physical symptoms. Affective would involve irritability, mood swings, tension, anxiety, sad or depressed mood, hopelessness, food cravings, increased appetite, sensitivity to rejection, and all of these uh, can be accompanied with dysmenorrhea, very painful menstrual periods. Uh, what triggers uh, PMS? Well, we think it has to do with ovarian steroids during the luteal phase, but there's a lot of other things that happen with neurotransmitters as well. So we see lower levels of serotonin, low GABA, possibly due to low allopregnenolone, and low beta endorphin are the ones that have been classically characterized. Um, we know that having problems in estrogen and progesterone are necessary, but they're not sufficient to cause PMS or PMDD. Uh, so usually estradiol and progesterone levels are normal, but we get abnormal responses to estrogen and progesterone. A um, lot of people out there, and this is kind of a, and there's been very little evidence to actually pinpoint this, but a lot of people suspect a lower progesterone and or a high estrogen to progesterone ratio in the luteal phase. Uh, so more of an estrogen dominance picture. So a lot of the kind of uh, functional and naturopathic support for PMS involves clearing estrogens, maybe supporting progesterone uh, for PMS. Other hypotheses involve low melatonin, high sympathetic tone, uh, overactivation of the HPA axis with high cortisol, hypothyroidism, even subclinical, uh, insulin resistance, poor liver metabolism and detox, especially of estrogen metabolites, and then potentially adrenal insufficiency with low DHEA. So I find there's no one cause of PMS. In my patients, I'm looking through these different patterns, identifying them, and then treating them accordingly. Um, the diagnosis is based largely on history. So we get a detailed menstrual history, including medications, any oral contraceptive use, other health conditions, endocrine disorders. Uh, determine if there's a depressive disorder present, maybe using PHQ-9 uh, score is a way of, of going down that road. And then there aren't many labs to, there are no labs to diagnose PMS specifically, but we can use labs to help rule out other conditions, uh, like looking at thyroid, TSH, looking maybe for anemia, etc. cetera. Uh, the diagnostic criteria for PMS are to have one to four physical or behavioral symptoms. Symptoms are during the luteal phase and not during the follicular phase, and symptoms interfere with activities of daily living. For D PMDD, according to DSM-5, you need to have five or more symptoms, and one has to be effective in nature. Uh, symptoms are present for at least a year, and that involves using symptom diaries. 
and there should be no other psychiatric disorders like generalized anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder co-diagnosed. So that's uh, the technical assessment for the different types of PMS and PMDD. So PMS um, is uh, fairly well treated with level one, level two therapies. So some of the things we have found through the literature that um, can be helpful would be avoiding refined sugars, high protein diets, maybe eliminating dairy, uh, looking at uh, the different types of fats in the diet. Uh, there is a use of what's called seed cycling, which has, it's more anecdotal. There's actually no clinical research that I've seen on seed cycling and that's to use flax and pumpkin seeds during the follicular phase, um, and then to use uh, sesame seeds and uh, sunflower seeds in the luteal phase. And the idea is to try to balance the estrogen-progesterone ratios using those different seeds. Um, I have many women describe anecdotal success with that. Others have reported no success, so it's, uh, I think it really varies there, and there's certainly other factors always involved. Uh, high salt diets, again, uh, would be a problem here. Increasing uh, fresh fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds. Again, the seed cycling, I put a question mark there, whole grains, fish, getting regular exercise, and then the classic lifestyle stress reduction things we've already talked about would be indicated. In terms of the herbal therapies, you know, working with liver clearance, working potentially with sedative adaptogens, but maybe with phytoprogestins and some of the Progestins would be like Vitex. I mentioned peony as well, a very important one. We don't use that as much in Western herbal medicine. This is in Chinese medicine referred to as Bai Sha, white peony. Um, viburnum, Smilax, Glyceriza, Alcamilla, Salvia, sage, uh, uh, regular uh, garden sage, uh, wild yam, Elytris, Colophyllum, etc. These are potential phytoprogestins, but we just don't have a lot of research on them yet, but this is how they're often used uh, in the literature. All right, so that's uh, phytoprogestins as a potential level two therapy. Um, zinc, magnesium, B6, uh, the evidence is unclear, but these are commonly prescribed uh, for PMS. Usually level three therapies are not needed unless you know thyroid replacement or something is needed. Uh, typically, on the biomedical level, for very severe PMS or PMDD, um, usually the, uh, for women who don't want contraception, um, they, um, we can uh, use uh, SSRIs like sertraline, citalopram, SNRIs like venlafaxine, the effects are, uh, especially for PMDD, uh, and then an oral contraceptive progestin for those who do want contraception to suppress the HPO axis and we reserve that for more severe cases. There are last resort therapies for very severe PMS, PMDD, using, using uh, GnRH agonists uh, as well as uh, surgery. Remember the agonists are a little confusing. They can actually block ultimately the production of FSH, LH uh, by overstimulating the hypothalamus. So you get the negative feedback. Uh, and in surgery, it would be to remove the uterus and the ovaries. So that's very severe. And again, some women, even after hysterectomy, continue to have PMS-like symptoms. So I think the level four therapies, I rarely resort to those, but there are some cases when I think it's appropriate to consider that. We always have to take the patient's needs and uh, desires into our consideration together with the guidelines um, in making our decisions. But uh, generally, we focus on level one and level two therapies for the majority of patients. Finally, we come to amenorrhea, and that is the absence of a menstrual period in the woman of reproductive age. Uh, a normal menstrual cycle, again, occurs, occurs every 21 to 35 days. Uh, and, you know, again, by the other definitions that go, there's a little bit of a range there. Uh, pregnancy should be ruled out in all cases of um, amenorrhea. So, uh, typically, we just do that as a standard test. Even if a woman says it's unlikely that I've been pregnant, we just confirm that. Um, and it can be primary or secondary. So again, primary amenorrhea um, is going to be the absence of menarche and the presence of normal growth and secondary sex characteristics by the age of 15, or no secondary sex characteristics like breast development and no menses by the age of 13. So those would be the defini definitions of primary amenorrhea. This is going to be less, much less commonly encountered in the clinic because um, unless you're working with teens, um, you know, if you're working with adults, we're usually not going to see this as much. 
Um, the most common causes would be chromosomal abnormalities like uh, Turner and uh, gonadal dys dysgenesis, um, having what's called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, uh, or it's also known as functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. I'll talk about that in the next slide here. Um, and uh, that can result in GnRH deficiency and so forth. Um, anatomic causes like malarian agenesis, absence of the uterus, cervix, and or vagina, having a transverse vaginal septum or imperforate hymen, uh, pituitary diseases like prolactinoma or hypopituitarism, and then other things like androgen insensitivity, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, PCOS, and Cushing's. All right, so our assessment for primary amen amenorrhea would involve the complete history, looking for pubertal development, breast development, uh, looking at nutrition, eating habits, exercise habits, uh, medications, family history, looking for the telltale signs of Turner syndrome, uh, any signs of hyperandrogenism with acne, hirsutism, or virilization, uh, looking for severe stress, which could induce hypothalamic amenorrhea. And I'll, again, I'll talk about that in the next slide, but that's often uh, in conjunction with what's called female athlete triad, um, where uh, women will uh, over-exercise, have very low caloric consumption, uh, and usually have high stress and anxiety, and all of that can suppress the hypothalamus and gonadotropins. Um, headache with visual changes might indicate a pituitary tumor, and then galacteria might indicate excess prolactin. So the physical exam uh, would include the uh, pelvic and the breast exam, so a full gynecologic exam. And then we'd rule out pregnancy. Again, look for uh, breast development as a marker of estrogen levels. Uh, uterus, we look at the presence of the uterus, whether or not there's any scarring or any other issues there with ultrasound and or MRI. Get an FSH level, and check for anemia, thyroid, prolactin, GnRH, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. So do a full workup of all the different hormones there. Uh, with increased S FSH, you might consider a gonadal dysgenesis, and then we want to obtain a karyotype to rule out Turner or another genetic problem. Uh, and if it's the 45X mosaicism, then we need to consider surgery to remove the ovaries. Uh, if the FSH is normal and there's an absent uterus on ultrasound, uh, then we want to consider malarian agenesis or androgen insensitivity and check the testosterone levels. If the FSH is normal and the uterus is present, then we want to get an ultrasound um, that will detect uh, blood in the uterus or the vagina, and we might uh, consider their outlet tract obstruction. Uh, and then if the FSH is low or normal, uterus is present, there might be a constitutional delay, might be pituitary uh, deficiencies or congenital GnRH deficiency. All right, pretty technical there. That's more for your reference. Again, this is not going to be as commonly encountered as secondary amenorrhea, but it's important to be able to think through a case of primary amenorrhea uh, if you encounter it in the clinic. Finally, we come to um, secondary amenorrhea. This is a lack of regular menses for three months or having had irregular menses and then they go away for at least six months. Um, and there's many causes, so we need to evaluate that. So amenorrhea is not something you should just leave alone. It's something that needs to be investigated. And if that's something that uh, is sort of outside your scope of practice and whatnot, be sure to refer to the appropriate providers to do that. So the causes of secondary amenorrhea include ovarian causes, that's up to 40%, and that would be either PCOS, and that's about 20% of cases of amenorrhea, Remember, we need two out of the three Rotterdam criteria, including hyperandrogenism, oligo or amenorrhea, and polycystic ovaries to make the diagnosis. And we have the two types, ovarian and adrenal, which require different treatments. Uh, primary ovarian insufficiency or failure, uh, this would be again um, before the age of 40, where we get low estrogen, progesterone, and high FSH. Um, and here we're going to get, because of the low estrogen, endometrial atrophy, and that'll cause cessation of menses. And as we talked about, many causes like autoimmune disease, drug therapies, idiopathic, et cetera, for POI. Um, hypothalamic causes would be about 35% of what causes secondary amenorrhea, and this would be functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, um, and or FHA. So that would be um, having low gonadotropins and FSH-LH, no mid-cycle LH surge, so there'd be no ovulation, 
and having low estradiol with osteoporosis. Uh, and the most common cause of this, is, again, is the female athlete triad with amenorrhea, uh, anorexia or bulimia, and osteoporosis. Um, so that's always something to, to delve into in the history. Uh, severe stress, overexercise, weight loss, nutritional deficiencies like from celiac disease or uh, having type 1 diabetes, all of these would contribute to functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Then about 20% of causes are pituitary, and uh, prolactinoma is the most common. Uh, you can have others, you can have Sheehan or these others, but um, always think about a prolactinoma. And then 5% are uterine causes, and that's Asherman syndrome, and that's acquired scarring of the endometrial lining. Uh, and that's uh, after usually a uterine procedure, like a uh, dilation in cuterage, like for abortion. Uh, and then others would be hypothyroidism, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and adrenal tumor. All right, so how do we work this up in the clinic? Well, you want to get your full history and physical exam with the full gynecologic exam. Uh, look at the look at the patient's nutrition, eating habits, medications, family history, medical surgical history, any uterine procedures, uh, any signs of hyperandrogenism, acne, hirsutism, etc. Uh, severe stress, again, that might induce the hypothalamic amenorrhea, any headache or vigil changes, might indicate pituitary tumor, and then galactorrhea, indicating excess prolactin. Um, for our labs, we want to order first a pregnancy test, uh, then check for anemia with CBC, ferritin, CMP, uh, and that would check for electrolytes as well. Um, and then we want to get an FSH, a prolactin, a TSH, and an estradiol. Uh, and if uh, there's a mild elevated prolactin, if it's less than 50 nanograms per milliliter, but it's a little elevated above the normal range, we want to repeat that again. Okay, so those are the standard tests. Now we're going to add testosterone and DHEA if you suspect high androgens from the clinical picture. Uh, if the testosterone is over 150 nanograms per deciliter or DHEA is over 700 micrograms per deciliter, we're going to consider an androgen secreting tumor. Um, consider then the need for uh, an ultrasound to check for the endometrial thickness. Um, and uh, we might need to do a, and also for polycystic ovaries, uh, and then something that's sometimes recommended if you suspect a uterine scarring problem would be a progestin with, uh, withdrawal test, and that really uh, tests uterine function. So I don't typically do this if I suspect a woman needs it. I usually refer it on, but it's not that difficult to do. You give medroxyprogesterone acid, Acetate for 10 days, um, 10 milligrams for 10 days, and then stop. And uh, if there's a withdrawal bleed, that means that there's a normal estradiol with anovulation. So the endometrium thickened appropriately, and she uh, uh, just didn't have, uh, just had anovulation. If there's no withdrawal bleed, that means there's uh, either low estradiol or uterine pathology. Um, if there's no withdrawal bleed, you can then give estradiol times one month, either transdermal or the conjugated equine estrogens, plus the medroxyprogesterone acetate 10 milligrams a day on days 30, 26 through 35. And that's gonna prime the uterus uh, and then you withdraw. And if there's no bleed, that indicates that there is uterine scarring. So uh, the uterus is just not responding to the hormones appropriately. So that's uh, the progestin withdrawal test, a way of assessing uterine function. Um, if you suspect the CAH, you're going to get the 17-hydroxyprogesterone, pituitary tumor, MRI, maybe prolactin again, uh, Cushing's, the one-night overnight dexamethasone suppression test, or just a 24-hour urine cortisol. Addison's would be our morning cortisol around 8 a.m., and then a PCOS, diabetes, uh, uh, diabetes mellitus, get your hemoglobin A1C and lipids, and then celiac disease, your tissue uh, transglutaminase, IgA, that's, that's the uh, screening test for celiac. Uh, and then we'll treat the underlying disorder for each of these. So that's a lot, but just uh, keep this in mind when you encounter patients with secondary amenorrhea. Again, this is a fairly common presentation to primary care practices or to acupuncture integrative care practices. So it's important to kind of be able to think through 
uh, which of these things might be causing uh, a woman's secondary amenorrhea. Okay, so that is a wrap for the female reproductive uh, uh, pathology. Um, if you're in Chinese medicine, I'll do further videos on gynecology and you'll review that. But if you're in the naturopathic program, the gynecology aspect will be covered uh, in your next year. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to take this information and integrate it uh, with what you learned there.